Let's continue our look at uh, that protest. The South African uh, Federation of Trade Unions are saying the set minimum wage will widen in income quality, inequalities. Rather, uh, Joining us to discuss this on the show is Labour lawyer Sheriza Raja. Good evening, Sheriza. Thanks very much um, for joining us this evening. Well, first of all, if one looks at uh, um, the, the demands, I mean, um, you know, part, there's the 20 rands per hour um, issue, uh, but also also the introduction of a comprehensive social security uh, system that tells us that the issues SAFTU is raising aren't purely legal, isn't it? Yeah. I think that there's a huge cry to help those that are most in need. The problem then is how we go about addressing that with an economy that has vast income disparities on the one hand and is also facing its own perils in terms of multinationals deciding whether to survive here, whether to close shop, mining operations looking at whether to stay in South Africa or move into East and West Africa that's less regulated. So I think it's, it's an economy that's in a precarious state as it currently is. And, and that's the point of NEDLEC, isn't it? True. To get the workers. Um, um, business, you know, uh, civil society and the government to talk. To find a middle ground, a happy media. Find one another. Yeah, where everyone can sustain. And I think a settlement is exactly that. It's not one where you win or I win. It's where we both walk away saying, I didn't get exactly what I want, but I think I can live with what I have. Um, and if you look at uh, the National Council of Trade Unions, if you look at FEDUSA, if you look at the political analysis that's going on, there's, there's a, a large, overwhelming even school of thought that's saying, we're not saying 20 rand is enough. In fact, no one is even saying that from, from what I can see in the media and in the, in the um, um, exposés put out. What they're actually saying is that it's a start. Um, it's, it's bringing them closer from what they were. Um, I read that, that NACTU is saying that 40% of workers currently earn below the current proposed national minimum wage. Um, FEDUSA is saying that that amount is actually at 4.5 million workers who, once this minimum wage is promulgated and, and, and implemented, will benefit from this as opposed to being left into the, in the hands of Bucky Brigade employers. Well, I mean, but uh, is there anything inherently wrong in SAFTO saying? Saying that may well be a good starting point from where the rest of you are concerned yes. but from where we sit we have struggled for a living wage and not a minimum wage but also remember that the national minimum wage doesn't take away from what wage employees already have also, the sectoral determinations in terms of farm workers and domestic workers remain in place. So in other words, there were issues, there were things in the media being said that farm workers would lose the, 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 the housing benefit and the provident fund because of the minimum wage. The, the minimum wage doesn't even apply to them right now, so it wouldn't take away what they currently have. And also, there's a large group of wage employees who are protected by bargaining council uh, collective agreements. This wage is aimed to protect those that are what we call in the informal sector that don't get the contracts of employment, that don't get any particulars of employment, and by and large may not even know about their labor rights um, in terms of protection, in terms of working time, overtime, night shift allowance, meals, uh, rest periods. They don't know these things. And, and the minimum wage aims to find that group and tell them, we're here to protect you. It's a starting point. And also, the minimum wage legislation, the Act provides for a review by the Minister of Labor um, on an annual basis. So so the 20 rand is not the 20 rand ad infinitum. It's the 20 rand now subject to review again. Um, and there's also hefty fines for non-compliance. Um, the fact that there's now... Well, an issue has been raised around compliance. Yes. Who's going to, uh, you know, ensure that people actually comply? But who better than the CCMA? Then trained commissioners who arbitrate on issues around terms and conditions of employment, who are trained in the field of labor law and understand and can assist employees on, um, how, on how to enforce these awards and how to get writs and how to get the money that may well be owing to them. So you reckon that issue too, that of ensuring compliance is actually taken care of? 
I think that there's a school of thought that says that the CCMA is better placed to, to deal with this. Uh, previously, issues around compensation for employees earning under the, the annual, the BCA annual earnings threshold, lay with the Department of Labor. So you'd have to wait for a, an inspector to go out, issue a compliance certificate. There's, there's, a, there's a whole uh, dispute re resolution procedure thereafter. It could even land up in the Labor Court. Um, the way I read the National Minimum Wage Bill as it stands, it goes to the CCMA. And in the CCMA, you can get a case number very quickly. You can get a matter set down for conciliation and then arbitration very quickly. Um, so there, there's, there's, there, there are two opposing play schools saying, one saying, well, let me tell you that, that that's going to make it longer. And there's another one saying, but hang on, I actually think it would be a lot faster to go through the CCMA. And the CCMA has trained arbitrators, conciliators who are there and are, are there to, to equip people to find each other in the conciliation process at least. Okay. Now, it's not only the minimum wage, of course, that um, uh, SAFTU has an issue with, with. there is yeah. the issue of the labor law um, um, around amend. strikes um, yeah. because I mean Parliament is considering uh, amending the Labor Relations Act the basic yeah. conditions of employment uh, act as well as the new national minimum wage bill yeah. now SAFTU is arguing that this is going to, or what is being proposed, yeah. is going to make it difficult for workers to, to, to strike, which, yes. is, which is their right. Yes. From what I understand, it's that there's three things happening. Number one is when you, want, when you refer a dispute on, on, on terms and conditions of employment, we call that a mutual interest dispute. That is, that is resolvable through strike action, uh, collective bargaining, industrial action, all these terms loosely thrown around. When you get, when you refer the dispute to the CCMA, you then uh, get issued with a certificate of non-resolution if the parties don't resolve. That strike, that, that certificate allows you then on notice to embark on strike action. Now the certificate of conciliation of non of non outcome is being extended from 30 days to 35 days. Um, the second thing that's happening is that prior to embarking on a strike. Now, what would happen is a trade union would give an employer 48 hours notice of an intention to strike. What the amendment proposes is that there be a secret ballot. Now, the, the unions are saying that this individualizes what, what they see as a collective right. But the whole, the whole rationale behind that arises from Marikana, from the issue around, do you really want to strike? Are you being intimidated? Are you being bullied? You must remember, employees within the confines of a trade union live in communities. Um, how often have we seen, in my time in practice, um, I've seen very often that employees may well want to come to work because they don't want to go on the principle of no work, no pay. But they live in communities, their families are threatened, they feel, they feel unsafe. How often have you heard stories, I mean, as labor lawyers, many of us know that when our clients want to bring in scab labor, they bring them in early hours of the morning and they put balaclavas over their heads because they're so scared to be seen. And these are people who want to work. So all we're doing is the law is saying, let's look at who actually wants to support the strike. The third thing is the advisory arbitration. Now, the advisory arbitration um, is, is something that, that has come about in, in various forms, even when the, the bills were, the, the acts were amended in 2015. So this is the second amendments that have come in the space of three years. Now, the, this, this advisory arbitration says that we're going to get an expert panel. It will be convened before the CCMA, and, and we will try and find the parties. Now, the outcome of that will be binding unless it's appealed. But if you look at that advisory arbitration, um, the unions are saying that this is collective bargaining. Why are you involving outside parties in what should be my democratic processes? But the memorandum behind these proposed amendments say all we're trying to do is to find the means for parties to engage in a substantive issues underlying your want to strike. So before you get into the no work, no pay, let's try and find what's actually motivating that and unpack that and see if what you're asking for is really unreasonable. And Mr. Employer, why are you not wanting to find them? Let's move the parties closer together. And if any of us have been to the CCMA recently, we know that in conciliation, commissioners mean business. They want to know what do you want and what do you want? And how do we find, how do we bridge this gap? How far apart are you really? Now, 
Is that really a bad thing? I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm following both sides very closely, and I want to understand what it is that's, that's, that's prompting this kind of strike action. I mean, it's, it's a massive strike that, that went on today, and workers are upset and angry, employers are agitated. Um, I don't know how all this will pan out, but I do know that the bulls sat in Parliament again, and, and the la last deliberation was on the 19th of April, uh, where all the input from, from the public sector, the private sector, uh, uh, was discussed, and we're now waiting to see what the outcome is. Um, but yeah. well, in, in this, I mean, there's there's a couple of things I, I would have wanted to uh, follow up with you, and one of them was that intimidation doesn't come only from one uh, side. Mm. I mean, as our history has has uh, proven. Yes, you're right. I mean, workers come from communities, and if uh, there are workers there that may not be so keen to go on strike, they may well be intimidated. But intimidation also comes from employers, mm. right? Um, where people fear that uh, you know if they do go on strike and they may well want to go on strike, but uh, they may lose their jobs. And it may not happen today, but it may happen next week or, 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 or next month. But, uh, I mean, before I, no, I, I let you go, this other issue, of course, that uh, Saftu um, was raising today is its uh, uh, NEDLEC uh, membership, given the changes that yeah. were made only a year ago, insisting that a, a federation has to be there in, uh, you know, for at least two years. Yes. yes. Of course, there's other things like yes. audited membership and yes. so on. But it, it does sound a little bit well, strange. I hear you, but let's look at the parties that are sitting at the negotiating table right now. You have business, you have organized labor, but in terms of organized labor, you have well-established uh, federations that are sitting there with an entrenched understanding of, of what it is that's going on on the ground and how they've applied that over the years. Um, I, I know that SAFTU feels aggrieved that they haven't been given a seat at the table. Um, and and, and it, 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 it must be recognized that they have embarked on this immediately ahead of Workers' Day. Um, but that being said, it's, it's one thing to say, I want a seat, but it's another thing to also say, well, what are your procedural requirements and why are they in place? And how am I being denied that? How, how is that prejudicial to me? And why are you motivated to, to, to have this two-year ban? You know? And then the question is, well, is it really a ban? Or is it actually an operational requirement necessitating that? Um, from which, only, which, which it must be pointed out, only happened after these um, unions broke away from well, it was never necessary before. The parties were all clear. Things were so clear. I mean, if you think of how AMCO came to the fore, things have changed a lot since there's, there's new players in the field. And we always welcome change as labor lawyers, you know. <laughs> but that being said, I don't think that there's a right and wrong approach here. I think that both parties have, have genuine concerns. But I think that there, there is a medium that can be found through NEDLAC. And I think if we support it, if we put our inputs in, and we wait for the deliberations, we may well find each other. Um, I would be loath to run, run out and say all's not well just yet. Well, let's hope that they will indeed find one another for the sake of the workers themselves. Absolutely. That's all we're going to leave. Thank you very much for coming through this evening. Sharissa Raj.